but it's something that first started with me personally. I'm going to be letting you guys in on a secret tonight about something I have to deal with in order to keep my walk in the Lord. And you know what? When I get to it, you're going to find out I have to deal with that same thing. Last week, we finished up our teaching on You Were Built to Last. And if you need to go back, go back to our Facebook page or YouTube and check out those videos. It was a powerful message on the story of Ruth. But we talked about Naomi and how that all fits together. So you need to go back and look at that. But tonight we're coming from a different uh, place on our Fired Up broadcast. So I'm going to start this way so you can come in with me. Have you ever uh, had a day where you were frustrated about something and without cause? Matter of fact, it was downright evil. Let me tell you about it. I'll get right to the teaching. Here's what happened. I found myself driving down 49, this is local highway where we are here, if you're looking at me in a little distance, and there's a, a crossroad where, as the traffic is coming at heavy traffic time, uh, they have to either let you out when you're coming or let you in. Now, ahead of us is a light. This light goes on fast, so if you're in this lane of traffic, heavy traffic that's going, you got to go, and if you're coming this way, you got to get in when you can get in. Well, I'm riding down the road, and usually how it goes is, if I'm coming to, you know, the right way, I'll let a car in. Then if the next person after me drives on, because we're letting the traffic flow, right? Then the next car, let a car in, and we keep going. Well, that day, I was in a hurry. Y'all ought to hear this. And three people ahead of me let cars in. Before I knew it, I was in my car speaking in tongues. I was, I was so upset. I was sitting there saying, why are you let, I'm talking out. Why are you letting those people in? You're, this person let somebody in. Why are you trying to let somebody in? That's not the rules of the road. And I found myself so frustrated. And I found myself dealing with, long after I got through the traffic, our topic of discussion tonight. And that is, I had an attitude. I want you to write it down. An attitude, when you get one, it's spiritual. Let me fool you. It did not go away. I had an attitude. We're going to talk about tonight. I mean, I had so much energy and strength. If, if I could have got out of the car, I probably could have choked three people before I was taken to jail. So I found myself saying, wow, here is where I'm going. Attitudes are powerful. The reason some of you fail at your deliverance is you don't have an attitude about getting the things you want from God. An attitude of deliverance is what we're going to talk about tonight. Just like I had an attitude when I was riding down the road and it propelled me into my thinking, my whole being, you need to understand that the Bible lets us know that an attitude is important if you're going to handle your situation. What am I talking about? Watch this. You can be right up until the moment you have to deal with a trial. You can tell yourself, I'm ready for this. My question to you is, but what happens in that moment? What, what happens in the moment when the fear comes? What happens? Oh, I'm tough until i got to deal with that moment. What happens to the moment when, you know, the anger comes? I'm good till I get to that moment. you got to understand how to make sure we talk about the Bible uses. I'm going to show you how the Bible uses our attitude for deliverance. All right? I want you to see this. Now, I want you to check this as you go on. Deliverance is always possible. If you're a child of God, I'm giving you some good news right off the bat. I don't care what you're going through. Deliverance is always possible. Come on, say that with me if you believe that. Deliverance is always possible. Not only is deliverance always possible, deliverance is always a believer's right. The Bible tells us that if I'm a believer, 
I can always be delivered. There's nothing so far gone that I can't get out of it. I don't care if it falls apart. God is a restoring God. You might know God is a God who can bring back what I lost. He can fix what wasn't there. He creates something out of nothing. Oh, I want you to get excited about the fact that deliverance is uh, always possible if you're a believer. It's my right if I'm a believer. Deliverance has been won by Christ, but the foundation of our deliverance is always the attitude upon which you live out and walk through your faith. Let's talk about it. What is an attitude? I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you an understanding quickly so you know that an attitude is something we have to work up. And there can be bad attitudes and good attitudes. Come on. I had a bad attitude when I was on the road, what I just described to you. But when I'm standing there toe-to-toe with the devil and I'm fighting off, you know, I'm fighting off the whatever attack he's had against me, i got to have an attitude or I can't sit up there and cry and whine and feel bad. You can't be tough until the moment happens. You have to learn, i got to get an attitude that says I'm supposed to be delivered. Somebody right now ought to toughen up. You'll get something out of this lesson if you understand. I am supposed to be delivered. I I don't have to sit here and settle for that. God said I'm supposed to be delivered. Now, we all have had an attitude, so don't go there and say, Reverend Duncan was teaching on, I got to get an attitude. You do, but it's an attitude about your deliverance. So what is an attitude? That's what it is. This is from the Oxford Dictionary. I had a lot of places that I looked up attitude, but this one aligns with the principles of Scripture. Look at it. A settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something. Typically, one that is reflected in our behavior. Wow, that, that's, that's powerful. Watch what it says. It's a settled way of thinking. It's settled. I'm not a loser. It's settled. I'm not going to. I'm not going to stay like this. It's settled. Everything that I need, God already has. So, first of all, you have to have a. You can't sit there and wonder if I'm going to die. Wonder if it's going to fall apart. You got to settle in your mind that I serve a God who is powerful enough to make sure He delivers us. So, the first thing is, it's a settled way of thinking. But here is something different that we don't usually talk about with faith. You got to feel this thing. It is a feeling. An attitude comes up, and I got to I settle it in my mind. So it's the way I feel about it. It's like the intangible of love. Right now, somebody sitting there. I want you to perk up, put your chest out. I don't care what the enemy is doing right now. I want you to rise up and get an attitude about your deliverance. Don't sit there and let the enemy keep you like you are. Watch this. It's typically one that is reflected in your behavior. So, it's a settled way of thinking. It's the way of feeling about something or someone. I'm giving you valuable information. You will never get delivered until you believe you're supposed to be delivered. You will never get delivered until you stand in that enemy's face, just like I was angry in that traffic, and tell the devil, you will not do this tonight, not to me. Get an attitude about how you want to live and what you think. So three things you got to understand. It's settled. I'm not running around guessing. That means that I live a life that I'm connected to God. So it's settled. Number two, I gotta feel this thing. You can't walk around. I'm not telling you to worry about feeling. I'm telling you to feel for that attitude. So fear is coming this way, but on the inside of you, you got an attitude brewing up saying, "Fear, you can't come all the way in because I've already got an attitude about my deliverance." And then next, it is something that's reflected in your behavior. You see it, it's settled. You feel it, and then you act on it. Wow, that's powerful. You settle it. You, you, you feel it, and then you act on it. The reason some of you have never shouted. I remember one time a, a young person asked me, said, Pastor, how do you just take off shouting like that when something hits you? i tell you why. Old folks used to say it like this, something <laughs> got a hold of me. But the reality is, even when the Spirit comes upon you with a kind of glory or the Spirit comes upon you, you still will not move until you release yourself to the spirit that's coming. So you got to understand that it's a feeling because I release myself to that feeling because it's an attitude. The next thing, attitudes can be good or bad, but must be internally worked out. I gave this, this statement a screen by itself because I want you to understand something. 
um, because of the word that was in me, I realized that I was wrong for wanting to kill, excuse me, not kill, no, hurt <laughs> the people in front of me. I was wrong, right? So what made me know that is internally I knew that my attitude did not line up with the word of God. Ah, and you and see, we easily spot the attitude that don't line up with the word of God when we're angry. But how about the word of God when we're sitting back being weak and wimpy? You can't sit there and tell me the God that you serve, the God of Shekinah glory, the God of power is going to sit there and watch you and want you to be, after he put all the anointing on you, after he ignited you with his spirit, after he allowed you to be born again, he did not allow you to be born again so you could sit there and cry and act like it's okay. Now, I'm not saying you never cry. I'm saying that even if I'm crying, I'm fighting off those tears with my attitude. You've got to have an attitude. Let's talk about it. So, our text to talk about this is Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. Come on, let's read this together. And I want you to hear this text tonight. And I wanted to read it so you'll know where God has us. Uh, let's see. I'll start. Just give you a little update. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, has captured the best and brightest of the children of God. When Babylon went in and Jerusalem and, and Israel fell, Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar. So he took the best and the brightest, which was Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, he took the ones who were the smartest and the most accomplished. And the high. So he took the best and brightest, and he was trying to convert them from their belief in Jehovah God to beliefs in their God. That's why he changed their names. And you can go into the text and see that Daniel, he called Belshazzar, and then he had names for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are the names they gave them from Babylon. Now watch this. So the king decided, Nebuchadnezzar, he was going to build this idol in the middle of the desert, and he said, when you hear the music play, you have to bow down. I wish, and, and you know, when I was growing up, there was a song they called, If You Dance to the Music, You Gotta Pay to the Piper. I don't know if you know that song. You know, I'm dating myself. But what I'm saying is the world always tries to get you to dance to their music. So when fear comes, your body and your mind naturally is saying, I should be afraid. But you got to remember where we are. We are in the world, but not of the world. So I should not be living my life based on worldly inclinations or worldly thoughts or worldly feelings. I got to live them attached to the Spirit of God. You know, the Spirit of God said where two or three are touching and agreeing, His Spirit is in the midst. Do you know you can touch and agree with somebody, but if they are of a wimpy nature, they're not, their spirit is doing nothing for you. You got to grab somebody just like you saying, man, sister, I'm getting that spirit out of you. We're going to touch and agree, and you're going to be stronger for where you are. Now, the reason I said this teaching was, was uh, something that I needed is because I am quick. Uh, I am bad to get. Am I by myself? Is there anybody else out there who wants to fess up tonight? So it's not just me. I, I sometimes find myself getting an attitude. So I had to learn that if I shift the script of that attitude or take that same attitude that I have in something wrong and put it in my fight for my deliverance and my place and my purpose and my destiny, God gave you a destiny that you have to fight for. But the fight has to come when you get an attitude saying, it's mine, and I'm not going to let it go. You may be, you may, look, enemy, you may have me one week, that's too long. But if the devil gets on you two days, he shouldn't still be on you seven days later. you got to have an attitude to fight him off of you. So where we are right now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego decided that they were not going to bow down. And you always got some folks that run back and tell. There's always spirits out there. Somebody ran back, and they ran back to tell, and they said, Oh, king, you know, Sarah, we second have been to go to folks you brought out. We'll not bow down to your golden idol. Verse 17, then it said he was angry. We'll pick up at verse 16. Shadrach, me second have been to go. Well, I got to say verse 15 where he said, If you don't bow down, you're going to be thrown into the fire furnace. It's not going to be well if you don't bow. Now watch what it says. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm trying to show you the text with the attitude. They said, King, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer you. We don't have to think about what our answer is. Verse 17, it should be so. My God, who I serve, is able to deliver me from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand. But watch this. This is the part that got me. But I want you to know this. Here's the attitude. Watch the attitude. I want you to know, even if he don't deliver me, I will not bow. Oh, that's good. If he does not deliver me, I won't give out. If I got to go through this thing and hold on to God, you got to get the attitude that they said, if I don't get delivered, I'm not going to wimp out. I'm not going to sit around here and cry now. No, I'm going to go back with what they said. But I want you to be known unto you. I will not bow down and serve your God. I'm not going to serve the God of fear, the God of worry, uh, the God that's telling me I'm insecure. I'm not going to serve the God that tells me that I ought to be self-deprecating. I'm not going to serve the God that tells me I'm not good enough when my God chose me to be good enough. I'm not going to serve the God that tells me i got to line up to what people say. I'm going to serve a God that said, I chose you. I put my spirit in you. And you now have been ignited by me. Somebody watching me, do you know who you are? Did you know the Bible says, I am a friend of God? God made Abraham his friend. Have you ever thought about that? God said, Abraham can call me friend. Then he said, because you're the seed of Abraham, you are a friend. And we went around singing that song. I am a friend of God. Do you know what that means? God in heaven took a broken, flawed, doubtful vessel like me and said, you not only are my friend, you're going to be my child. And I'm going to sit around with all of heaven, with the angels at my disposal, with the anointing on my tongue, like the death or in the power of a tongue. And what a man speaks, he will eat the fruit thereof. You need to learn how to speak forth fruits that says, I'm being, I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm trying to move on. You're sitting there wallowing in a situation you don't have to be in. I need you tonight to rise up and get an attitude about your deliverance and about your life. This is more important. But I have a God who tells me, look what they say. I'm not careful to answer you. I need you to know I got a God who will deliver me. But if he doesn't, I'm sad. I'm ready. Let's look at that. In NIV, verse 16, he said, we do not need, in NIV it says, we do not need to defend ourselves. That's important translation. Because a lot of times, the reason we fall in our attitude is we're thinking of reasons to defend our position. Well, that's good. You're, you're sitting there trying to justify to the devil why you should be delivered. You don't have to defend yourself to him. You're trying to justify to yourself sometimes. Why should I be delivered? And you start going back to the I haven't read this week. Maybe this is on me because... No, it's on you because you won't get the right attitude. The attitude that you pick up at that moment will tell how God can work in your life. God, if He can spend time sending grace and mercy to get you head up off the floor and stop you from crying and dry the tears out your eyes, or He can spend time saying, wow, I'm getting ready to ignite you with some more power. Look at my child stand. I know this sounds crazy. Somebody watch me at home. I dare you to do this. Take your hand and just throw them in the air and, you know, get, get one of those winner's things going. Just tell yourself, I got an attitude. I'm out of this thing. I know this sounds crazy, but you got to psych yourself up to be who God made you. So the first thing is, for you to say, I'm not going to defend yourself, this is good. It's just letting you know, here's what I believe. God is in control. I need somebody to digest that. At a moment when it looks like your circumstances are in control, I need you to rehearse in your mind, God is in control. Not only that, this verse 16, they said we don't have to defend ourselves. The NIV verse 17 said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. Watch what they said. God is a rewarder of service. I didn't make that up. You say, God gives grace. Pastor, you, you, you're trying to bring us back to works. What, what are you talking about? No, you ought to read your Bible. The Bible says that um, he will reward those who diligently seek him. 
The Bible lets us know when he says, Well done, thy good and faithful servant, there's always some work that preceded it. There's always a moment where you stood out and did something that was not fleshly, that was not something that you wanted to do. It was something you did because the word inside of you said, This is what God would want you to do. Oh, man, it's not the thing, I'm sorry. I'd like to bang on it. This is what God would want you to do. That, that's got to drive you. I got to believe, first of all, God is in control. I got to defend myself. I know who I am. Secondly, I got to believe that God will reward me for my stance. Uh, take any scripture in the Bible, God rewards because of our stance. Right? So watch this. In verse 18, but even if he does not, here's what I believe in verse 18 they were saying. My God won't save. You say, Pastor, that's puzzling. How can you say if you don't? Because here's what I believe. It, it might be something strange. You've got to hear this. I believe the reason I learned in my maturity in Christ not to fall apart when things fall apart is because I believe that God allows everything to happen to me for a purpose. Even the bad things. All I'm saying is I know you may sit there and say, what are you talking about? I believe because of the God that I serve, even the bad things He uses for my good. So, if God allowed it, I'm sitting there saying, hey, it's getting ready to turn out for my good. God's getting ready to do something here. So, you got to understand that God will never fail. I love that verse. So, how do I get that attitude of deliverance? Am I loud enough, guys? How do I get that attitude of deliverance? You must be prepared to fight for your deliverance. I just told you God gave it to you, but he also wants you to fight for it. It's like anything else you got to hold on to. Let's talk about that. What do I have to fight, Pastor? you got to learn how to fight demonic warfare. I'm going to give you several areas that you need to fight in demonic warfare. All right? So the first one, I want you to write this down. Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 17. I'm just going to basically read verse 12 of Ephesians 6, just so you can, or you can see it. I think I have it in my notes here. So you can see uh, what God is saying. Okay. Go with me to uh, verse 12. Well, verse 11 is very significant. Put on the whole armor of God, right? You know that, that you may be able to stand. And then thirdly, I want you to know, verse 12 says, for we wrestle. There's the terminology. Here. We wrestle. So, 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 so explain that. What are you talking about wrestling? I'm talking about the fact that it's a fight. Uh, I'm on top when I got the right attitude. When I give in, the devil flips me over. And that's why sometimes your life goes up and down because it says, I'm wrestling with spirit. And there's four levels of demons in here. I saw the chapter on uh, demonic warfare. You need to go back to that. But there's four levels of demons you've got to worry about. Now, understand this. Sometimes we get so saved, we forget about demons. Sometimes we get so saved, we start looking at stuff instead of saying, it must be me, I must be weak. No, it could be the fact that you're in the middle of a spiritual battle with a demonic force that wants to tear you down because the devil does not want you to have the kind of life you're living. I always believe, God says, I work everything out for your good. So when the enemy is trying to steal from me, then I know that I'm wrestling with the Spirit. Look what it says. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, against principalities, fallen angels. There are fallen angels and demons assigned to you. That's right. I said they're assigned to you. They know your address. They are assigned to you. They know your address. So these demonic spirits that know your address are actually uh, um, in the position to tear you down, because remember what the devil does. He never comes across as the devil. He always comes across in your circumstances as something else. So I need you to understand why you're sitting here thinking it's your weakness. It's a demonic 
spirit trying to steal from you what God has. Against powers. The powers of this world. Remember that the Bible said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, that devil, that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. So there are demonic spirits that have some power, but they don't have godly power. Uh, the greater one still lives in you. But you need to understand, you've got to get an attitude to understand that demonic spirits are sometimes out to attack me and tear me down, and they are in a position to get me off my game. That's all they wanted. Uh, here, come on, here, let me explain to you. So you had two good nights, and because it was a spiritual week, you didn't, you know, you didn't think nothing of it. I'm doing good. I've been reading. I've been praying. I'm strong. And all of a sudden, the devil pulls some, uh, 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 some insomnia on you. Or you hear a bump in the night. Or old fear that you used to have comes back again. All I'm saying to you is that this is a demonic spirit that could come in and try to destroy you. And we're thinking it's us. We're in spiritual warfare, guys. Let me explain to you again. Against the darkness of this world, there is a dark spirits in this world and against spiritual wickedness. We know that there is wickedness. So what am I telling you? I'm telling you that don't change up because it's supernatural. Hmm. Don't get so naturally minded that you are of the opinion that I'm too mature for demons to be after me. Or don't get so caught up that you forget you're in a battle. What the devil does is try to get us in a position where we cannot win because of what the battle that we're fighting. Also, I need you to see something about that. So, Spiritual wickedness, and there's levels of demons. I don't have time to get into that teaching, but there's demons that are designed or always ready to attack you. God has a sign. God has a sign. The strength inside of you, and you are stronger than the devil. Can I give you some scriptures? I, I didn't put them up here. Let me give you some scriptures to tell you that you can fight. Luke ten nineteen tells us, "Behold, Luke ten nineteen, um, I've given you power to tread." on serpents and scorpions. I've given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. So, what is God saying? That they're coming. <laughs> I like this analogy. But I may have to walk through them to get to my feet. i got to tread on them. I mean, I'm walking on them. We, we act like, I don't want no demons in my life. But that's not what our life is about. And not only do it says that, when Jesus called his disciples, Luke 9 and 1, I want you to do scripture, he called them together and gave them power over demons. Why would God give us power over demons if we weren't supposed to fight demons? Okay, so don't listen to those folks that says there is no demon. Demonic warfare started in heaven with the devil trying to take over from Jesus Christ. We are a product of the victory at Calvary. And because we won through Jesus Christ our right, the devil is mad. And he may be mad at us collectively, but don't you ever think he's not mad at you individually. He's after you. And he will come as an angel of light and try to destroy you. Here is the best scripture I can give you. And that is 1 John 3 and 8. God is... Jesus Christ himself came to destroy demons. Let me read that scripture for you. 1 John 3 and 8. Let me read that. I'm reading it for you and I'm reading it for me too. I love the word of God. Always get yourself where you know the word of God. 1 John, am I right, 3 and 8? Oh, here it is. Uh, he who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So, several things we learned. Jesus came to destroy the devil, but the devil is working. 
every now and then. Nobody may not tell you this on main thing. Everybody wants to be, you know, celebrities. They don't want to get you back to old time church, but I believe in old time stuff. Every now and then, get you a bottle of anointing oil. Come on, sit around here wanting to get. I'm, I'm listening to that preacher. I'm getting this. I'm reading But make sure you believe in the functioning power of the Holy Spirit. Get you a bottle of oil. Anoint yourself. Anoint your house. You, where, where, where you think the devil at? Devil in your car? Anoint your dashboard. Devil coming in your bedroom? Anoint your bedpost. Anoint your door in your bedroom. You sitting around acting like, here you are. You want to have an attitude that I don't have to fight the devil. Yes, you do. Get an attitude against that joke. This is my house. You will not come in and destroy me. So Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and he gave us the works. Matter of fact, uh, we go to Mark chapter 16. It tells us that we can cast out demons. So understand. Okay, so the first thing. Man, I ain't going to get through this. I keep going. So if you're going to have an attitude for deliverance, the first thing you got to remember is you cannot be scared of spiritual warfare. It is real. It will pop up any time in your life. The second thing is you got to remember you you got to remember, you have a purpose. All right, so 1 Corinthians 9, 26. Apostle Paul said, another reason I fight for deliverance is I understand I'm not fighting just for today. How? I'm fighting for my tomorrow and my future. Here's what Paul said. I therefore run, talk about running this race, not as uncertain, so I fight not as though I'm beating the air. Don't run around fighting for the sake of fighting. Be strategic about your battle. Some things at a certain age in your life you should be able to ignore. It should be, the devil should just be, when the devil comes, you should be so strong in this area that you just, he should get mad. Uh, uh, I'm going to make you sick. Okay, cool. I got to go through something. Just wreck them off. You know? Wreck them off. All I'm telling you is when the enemy comes against you, quit focusing on that as if it's the end of the world. So if you're going to fight, you got to remember spiritual warfare. You got to remember, I got a purpose in this life. I'm not letting the enemy steal my purpose. Third reason you fight is not only your purpose. Okay, so the third reason you fight is not only your purpose. <laughs> you fight because of, you have to learn to fight the good fight of faith. Now, this is a tough one. Timothy was timid. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, wherein thou art called, and has the best a good profession before many. Here's what the good fight of faith says. If you know the word says it, then do what the word says. Um, you, you profess before God. Uh, I like what it says, profess before many. But what makes me strong sometimes is I know God is watching. Sometimes you should just want to please your father. You should, you should walk up and, you know, some of y'all don't even talk to God, but you learn how to talk to God. You should walk up and just say, oh, you know what, God? I feel weak right now, but, you know, I'm going to stand strong just because I'm your child. I'm going to do what you told me to do. I believe you. Sometimes joy, laughter will come. All because I started speaking to God. Sometimes you ought to stop what you're doing. You're waiting on somebody to come over to the house. I feel good when people are around. What about God being around? What about your Savior being around? Strike up your conversation with God. I dare you to get so God conscious that you turn the TV off and just sit there and start talking to God. Talk to God about crazy stuff. I remember I was going in the kitchen. I'm fixing dinner. The TV was on. I couldn't figure it out. Nobody was in the house with me. I started asking God, what are we going to eat for dinner? I start talking to God. God, I think I want some. I think I'll take some beans. I don't, I don't want the pork and beans. God, I think I'll take. I know it sounds crazy, but that's how close you have to get to God. You want this magic relationship where you're not with them any other time than when you're fearful or in battle. No, you got to ride down the road and say, God, that was so funny. <laughs> have you ever ride down the road and had a joke with God? <laughs> where you say, Lord, when I when I got done with that crowd. When I was driving down the road and I was so angry, I heard God say, there you go again. That's what happened to you last time. And I had to just laugh. Lord, I know. I shouldn't have done that. But I got angry anyway. I had an attitude. So fight a good fight. That means you fight to the end. I just said something. I believe it's revelation. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Fight to the end. Reverend, what's the end when you don't have to fight that battle anymore? 
fight until you win that battle. Uh, I feel better today. No, fight till you know in your attitude that thing can no longer block you from being who God said you should be. Here's another one. Forget the past. I love this one. You cannot capture a victory today if you let the devil bring all your failures of yesterday. You can't capture, uh, uh, Philippians 3.13, you can't capture a victory today. Can I tell you something that you should understand? My failure yesterday does not mean a thing. Matter of fact, Jesus paid for that. Did you know when I got saved, he knew I was going to fail? So he put an extra anointing for the next day. All I got to do is rise up and act like I don't even remember that failure. How do you think Paul came through so many destructive things in his life and yet was able to say, my brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He said, I haven't arrived yet, but this one thing, now Paul did a lot of stuff. He said, but the one thing I do, if I fall tonight, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning, forget it, reach for strength to reach on the next day. Look what he said. I forget those things which are behind and I reach forth. So why are we reaching for the failures of yesterday when God gave you a new day today? I understand something with you. God is faithful. Since he said, let there be, he continues to turn day into night, night into day. When we rise up, God said, I'm on my job. All you got to realize is you went through a few bumps. So what? You can't walk in victory today, as soon as you get in that same situation, all you think about was how bad you handled the last time. No. If you want to have an attitude of deliverance, you got to have an attitude that says, I don't remember no failure. My God is victorious. I'm going to walk in that victory. This is helpful. It'll stop you from running into those attitudes that are wrong because you'll tell yourself, I have to do better. That's how you get to the place that you can get. I'm going to be better tonight than I was last night. I don't care what the devil says. you got to forget. Deliverance. Now, we're going to go into this text so we can see. I'm going to give you three three different things that you can understand about deliverance through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to show you uh, about their attitude. The first thing he said was, deliverance, if I'm going to have the right attitude, is really a choice. i got to choose to be delivered. Now, watch verse 12. I want us to see this together and see them making a choice. Uh, I told you there's always somebody to go back and tell. There are certain Jews whom thou hast sent over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they, they started out saying certain Jews, then they ratted them out, right? Uh, and these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy God nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Don't sleep on that. Before we even get to the fiery furnace, where they had an attitude of deliverance, they laid the foundation by settling the fact that I'm making a choice not to bow. I'm going to make a choice not to give up. I'm making a choice not to serve other gods. Listen to me. I, I hate to tell this to you, but every time we give in to something, we made a choice to give in. Choice is a powerful spiritual weapon. Because if we make the right choice, God shows up. That's good. When I make the right choice, God said, all right, release the angels. Send down a new dose of anointing. When I make the wrong choice, God waits for me to repent. So I sit there in what little power I got. Until God hears me say, Lord, I understand where I messed up, or I get my attitude back right. You need to understand that, that they made a choice not to say, they can go in the fiery furnace. No, long before the furnace, they had made their choice. I'll make it so. What does that mean? It means that I expect some things to be uncomfortable. I expect to have some bad days. I expect to have to fight through some urges. I expect to have to fight through some stuff because I just made a choice. And when I don't make a choice, I make a choice. Because when you don't make a choice, the choice is made by the choice you didn't make. May not sound simple. Here's what I'm saying. When you allow yourself to do something, it is a choice. 
So, choice is powerful. So the first thing they said, before we even got to the fire, you know why the fire did not bother them? Because they made a choice about the fire before they even got to the fire. Hallelujah. You got to make a choice about something that scares you. You got to make a choice about something that you dread. You got to make a choice. You know, one of the hardest things in the world sometimes is being somebody's boss, right? And, and you got to, and sometimes you, you, you have to say or do things. Maybe even fire them. And you're sitting there dreading it. But you got to make a choice. Either you want to be the boss or you don't. I'll never forget a friend of mine. Uh, we both were, were driving, you know, expensive cars. And, and so he was telling me, man, I took my Mercedes down to get it fixed. And they wanted $196 for a light bulb. And he said, the man said to him, well, you wanted to drive a Mercedes. That's how much a light bulb costs. You want to be a powerful believer? That's how much it costs. You got to make up your mind. The choice that I'm going for, I'm ready to stand behind. So, they made a choice. Watch, watch, watch what choice does. Choice is a valuable spiritual way. I need, I need that plan in your mind because sometimes we don't believe it. We think we're just being blown all through and through. No, we're not. God is a precise God. God is an accurate God. God's not a God that thinks, well, I'm just going to do this. God has a choice. Watch this. Deuteronomy 30, 19. I like this because when Moses was giving the children of Israel his last will and testament, he showed them a character of God. It's so powerful. He, he, Moses was about to die. Joshua was about to take over. And then he said he called all the leaders into the camp. And he started rehearsing in their ear the history of how God had blessed them. And then he let them in on something that was happening. He was showing them God is always keeping from heaven. Once he gives you enough knowledge and enough revelation and you know the word, what God is saying, Moses said, I call under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, heaven and earth, to record this day against you. Now watch this. Heaven and earth, to record this day against you, that I set before you life and death, blessings and curses, choose life that you and your seed may live. Here's what Moses said. I'm leaving. You saw all the stuff I've been through. And you saw how at the end of the day, God blessed me anyhow. I struggled. But I know how to hold on to God. He said, now I'm just telling you, this day is going to be called before heaven and earth. And it's going to say, you have a choice. So you got a choice to choose to sit there and cry, sit there and be lost, sit there and feel sorry for yourself. I'm talking to somebody, thank you, Holy Ghost. Sit there and talk about what somebody did to you. Sit there and talk about how bad things are. Or you got a choice to speak life to your life. You can stand up and tell yourself. Uh, I may not have this, but look what I got. It may not be the best, but I could be here. You know, you look at the television and seeing all the people dying. And, oh, life is so bad. No, you ain't dying. Now, I'm not saying you make little of someone else who got coronavirus, but how about the fact one day you stand up and say, with all this plague in the world, Psalms 91 has covered my house. It shall not come nigh me. Celebrate your good times. Man, you said an attitude. Sometimes we can get in such a funky attitude. God can't do anything with us. You need to make sure you have a Holy Spirit attitude. If you choose, God will back up your choice. If you choose, God will back up your choice. Noah. I'm going to show you some people that had to make a choice in how they got victory. Noah made a choice to believe God. It had never rained. It never had been. They didn't know what rain was. All they saw was dew come up from the ground. And yet God told Noah it's going to rain. Noah worked over 120 years. 120 years building. Or he didn't work. You know, sometimes. That's right. I said 120. I ain't say 120 minutes. I ain't say 120 hours. I said 120 years. He worked on just a promise from God. And he built an ark. You know, he, know why he did that? Because he made a choice. Some of you don't realize. Once I chose to follow God, there's not a demon in hell that can pull me back. How many of y'all know that? How many were good serving the devil? You served the devil well. And when you were out there serving the devil, you didn't want to hear from God. It was like, God, God, take a break. Get out of my life. 
You didn't want God around you. You didn't want God to say nothing. How many you know, once I made a choice for God, devil, you're working up the wrong tree. I may not be the best saint in the world, but you know what I am? I'm a saint. I may not be the best scouter in the world, but you know what I am? I'm saved. I may not be out there all, you know, Bible reading and that, but you know what I'm doing? I'm getting on my knees and praying. My prayers may not be all eloquent, but watch me spit something out my mouth. All I'm telling you is, once you make a choice, that's where power comes from. So if you make a choice that um, even if I get insomnia, all of us have been there, even if I get insomnia, I'll make my choice. I'm going to live through it. So when it happens, it ain't so devastating. I knew I was going to live through this. Matter of fact, I got a couple books I need to read. And, uh, you know, I, I got a sandwich I want to make. You know, <laughs> I got some things I want to do. I ain't got to sit up here and just worry. I'm going to go I'm gonna go do something. I might go shoot a game pool. I don't know. All I know is my choice is to trust God until my sleep comes back. Your choice, my sister, my brother, is to trust God until the thing you need to overcome is in your grasp. But it can't happen until you make a choice. I got to choose. Abraham chose to leave his country. I like this one. Didn't even know where he was going. Some of us get so upset. God didn't even tell Abraham where he was going. Abraham just said, I'm going to follow you. Sarah chose to believe God when she was past child. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Because you got to remember, Sarah laughed. Sarah laughed. I believe Sarah looked down at herself and said, I am not having no baby. Baby time has passed. And yet, she said, if God said it, he can take a miracle. I, I, I love talking about, especially the older I get, I love talking about how God blesses us in our older age, meaning that we don't have to give in to stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, stuff's going to happen. It happens to all of us. I tell you, I got to the point where I didn't care whether I had on a blue sock or a brown sock. What's time I run home and change socks? What? You're going to get what you get. If I come here with a red sock and a blue sock, that's the style. I'm keeping my socks on. There was a time I said, oh, man, what happened to me? And, I mean, it just happens, right? So all I'm saying is some things that come with age, but they don't bother me anymore because as long as God is giving me health and strength, I can make it through those situations. But when you sit down and moan, I'm getting old and everything hurts, it'll hurt whether you moan or not. But you know what? It won't hurt as bad as long as you trust God. I really believe that. Keep the attitude. She gave birth when she was 100 years old. That is funny. She was 100 and gave birth. I'd like to see the doctor doing that. Anyway, take a picture out to mine. Moses chose to suck. This is a big one to me. Moses was living large. He was living in a a palace. He was like third in charge. Uh, Pharaoh loved him. He was a conqueror. He was a hero. And all of a sudden, he felt the call. Mm. He felt the call of who he was. And he decided to trade in all that the world had. And at that time, you know, it's really funny. When I traded in what I thought the world had, I thought I was really trading something in. Moses didn't realize till later. Because he had all that worldly stuff. He just said, he took off he, he took off that Egyptian garment, you know, purple robes, and walked into the mud pit so he could see his God. Can I ask you a question? How bad do you want to know? What are you willing to do to follow what God has in your life? What are you willing to give up? I ain't giving up none of my comfort. Some of us lose our blessing because we think about our comfort instead of God. Well, I got somebody thinking right now. All I'm saying to you is that you got to make sure you understand I got to make a choice. I can't keep walking this fence. Fear no fear. Fear no fear. Uh, uh, trust God, not this. You got to make a choice. I'm going to trust God no matter what prevails. Joshua marching around the walls of Jericho, the biggest obstacle in his path to the promised land. But he did it because God said so. Rahab, a prostitute, chose to follow God, cast down the idols of Jericho. You know, one time I used to emphasize that Rahab was a prostitute and God chose her. You know what God told me one day? So what? You prostituted. You weren't too. None of us were any better than Rahab. As you sit around and think, oh, God, God put a, a, a prostitute, a, a, a lady of the evening in his, look what else he put in his lineage. Look who else he calling child. You and I. And yet, Rahab 
with nothing but hearing about God, decided to hide the warriors of Israel and follow God and believing that the God of the, the Hebrews, the Egyptians, the Hebrews were greater than the, than the God and idols that her people followed, right? And we never look at it that way, but it was all a choice. So deliverance is a choice. Oh, I'm going to get through this. I didn't think I'd get this far, but it's a blessing. Deliverance is not only a choice. Deliverance costs. Here's a big one. Here is a big one. Verse 19. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury, and the form of his visage, I like King James, talking about how angry he got, right? Court was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You want to talk about attitude? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar had an uh, Therefore, he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been heated. They had that it had ever been heated. So, what happened here? In order to walk in your blessing, you must pay a cost. The cost that your pain is far less than what you will receive for paying the cost. The cost of trusting God is a bargain compared to the relationship, the blessing, and the full abundant life God will give you if you pay the cost. Thank you, Lord. Good, I'll stay here a minute. Pay the cost. The cost may be crying. The cost may be leaving someone. The cost may be trusting God when you don't see why I have to trust you. The cost may be to look at my life as not one of, you know, look at all the wrong things in my life, but turn around and start looking at your life as one that God is getting ready to bless. The, the cost, it, it costs something to serve God. I remember when I got saved, and I, I shared this with you, that, you know, I was singing in my band, and we had just, you know, now it's really a fly by night. We had a couple songs playing on the radio. We were getting ready to go off, and I thought I was going to make some records. And when I got saved, because my life was hurt, my heart was hurting, I remember when I finally yielded to God, all of my friends was running around telling me everything I lost. Man, we were getting ready to do this. You could have done this. Why in the world would you get saved now? And can I tell you? The reality is, everything we gave up has given us dividends and bonuses in the life we live. We may not have gone to every party once we got saved. We may have stayed home and didn't do some things and thought it was bad. But God said, I will reward that behavior. Pay the cost. And you pay the cost up front, you want to pay a cost in the back. How do you pay the cost? I'm going to give that to you too. How do I pay the cost? They had settled the issue. This is a good one, God. Who was the Lord of their life? You have to settle who you're going to follow. Am I the Lord of my life? Um, is God really the Lord of my life? And if He's the Lord of my life, does He have the right to tell me what to do? Can I just kick and buck against God when I want to? Or is God really my Lord who I bow down and worship? They settled the issue saying, I mean, I don't believe they wanted to go into the fire. Listen to me. I know they had they, all that. They didn't want to go in the fire, but they knew Jesus was their Lord and they were going to follow their Lord at any cost. They understood that God was in control of their life. There's another reason. If you're going to pay the cost, um, you look at it like um, God, this destructive part that I'm going through today, I don't see that how that's going to balance out next week. I, uh, I don't see how my friends are going through all this good time and I'm going through all this trouble. Why was I born like that? God, you must have made a mistake when you put that in my life. Did you just mess up? God, did you, what, what, what do you mean? I, was, I wasn't supposed to have that happen to me. Not the way I'm serving you. 
I've seen other folks that didn't do half. They didn't love you half as much as I did, God. Why is all of this mess in my life? God, this can't be what you wanted me to live. I said yes to you. This stuff was supposed to happen. I'm supposed to be in a party now. You must have made me sick. No, here's what happened. They understood that God was in control. I learned something in the workshop. It was so funny. There was an old woman teaching the workshop. And, you know, you go in there, and I'm this, you know, I'm educated Christian. I'm going to workshops, and we were, we were going up. Uh, I, don't, I don't know where this was, where this was, but we had gone to one of our conferences for our association. And, you know, I'm this just up and coming little, you know, minister. I thought I knew everything. You know, young stuff, you think you know everything. So I'm sitting there, and she was talking about some stuff, and I didn't want to listen. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God came to me. Here's what she said that I've never lost. Here it is. If God is in control, you can't be. And if you're in control, God can't be. Wow. That may not sound like much, but it has blessed me because I was sitting there thinking, either I'm going to control this situation because I think I'm in control of my life, or I'm going to turn it over to God because I believe God's in control of my life. But here's the kicker. Both of us can't be in control of our life. So if God is in control of your life, you can go through any situation and trust Him for it. Deliverance. Cost. One of the costs is i got to settle the issue of who's the Lord, and i got to settle the issue of who's in control. Because i always got an outcome or a plan that I want to do instead of what God wants to do. They understood God is greater than their circumstances. We're going to close with these two. I got to close tonight. I know. We're going to pick this up. We're going to finish this next week. They understood God is greater than their circumstances. So my circumstances got me down. But if I flip and start praying about these circumstances, look out for everything. <laughs> if I start praying to God about what's what I'm going through, He's going to come in and change some of this. You better believe that. That's what I trust. And last, they understood their stand could only take their earthly life. It's a tough one. But do you ever think, and I'm done, do you ever think, while you're sitting there fretting about, I'm about to lose everything, you know, case somebody's writing, do you ever think, when you say, I'm about to lose everything, and uh, I don't know how I'm going to handle this, did you ever think that the worst the devil can do is take my life on this side, but I still got an eternal life? Did you ever think the worst the enemy can do is tell me or trick me into losing my purpose? Or can you flip that and say, God promised me abundant life on this side and in the life to come, so I will not let the enemy take me there. I want you to tell you, uh, you need this teaching. You, you need to tell somebody, get an attitude. We live in some dark times. Uh, you don't know how many people are contemplating suicide, how many people the devil has tricked to take their eye off of their blessing. they got great lives, and if they ever live somebody else's life, they will realize how great their life goes. But right now, you got to get an attitude, and you got to rehearse some, de- some, some decrees and some declarations in your life. I decree I'm blessed. I declare I'm going to make it. I decree God is able. I declare my life's going to get better. And as you do, God, Bless you. We're going to talk about how to get an attitude of deliverance next week. Pray for me. Come on, pray. Somebody here right now. I got to pray this quickly. I'm going to pray for your attitude first of all. You've been sitting around moping around too long. Let's pray. Father God, I need you to ignite your servant to let them realize they were not born for defeat. They were created for victory. Let them get an attitude until that victory comes. Let them hold on to that attitude. Let them feel it. Let them settle it until it changes their behavior. Amen. Now, those of you who are not saved, pray this prayer with me tonight. Say, Lord God, I believe you died for my sins, rose again with all power. And because I believe it, say this, I am saved. Come on.
share with somebody this message you just heard tonight, somebody you know needs it so they can be strengthened. Uh, go to our chat room, leave us a message tonight. Uh, go to our YouTube channel, watch it again. It's going to be on again tonight. I just need you to know that the Word of God is your only way out. God bless you. Let's pass something to you. See you next week.